Please welcome Joe Dart. Yo, thanks for having me. It's so good to be here with y'all. Man, Joe. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, John, for grooving with me. John Keys. Yeah. And uh, yeah, thanks, thanks y'all for coming. I'm excited to uh, to be here and talk uh, talk bass, talk Wolf, yeah. talk whatever yeah, I gotta else. I got to get one thing, man. Get, play say some hello stuff. to them for a second. I'll get one. Um, yeah, this is uh, this is cool. This is a bit of a return for me because I, I did uh, go to the Baselines weekend uh, here at Berkeley many years ago when I was in high school and uh, was kind of starstruck by the whole, the whole place, the whole experience and uh, being surrounded by such great musicians, such great faculty. So yeah, very, very cool. For me to be back. Yes. Now we're talking. Now I see why. Now we're now talking. Now I see why yeah. you do it, bro. Yeah. Isn't that better? Isn't yeah, that better? It's, it's yeah. totally better. <laughs> I just want to be like this all the time. You can. Wow. Cool. Um, all right. So many things we want to run down uh, with you, Joe. First, I'd like to thank Mr. Al Reese, who uh, funded the Al Reese Visiting Artist Series here in the bass department at Berkeley. So a big thanks to Al. Yeah. Um, Joe, I, you know, it's kind of cold outside. I mean, it's going to get colder, but we just took a walk from the other building. We got cold water here. How, how, do, you, um, how do you keep your fingers... Uh, is that it? Warming up with a, yeah, with a nice little ditty like that, ideally. Uh, we played uh, Wolfpack. I uh, played some festivals this fall where it was freezing, and we had to... Uh, it was like very early on in the set that we played like it gets funkier and a few of these like 16th note uh you know truly like you know it's it's not it's not a it's not a warm up uh type of tune but uh but that's where i've discovered is is the best way to warm up so i appreciate john coming and, and uh and warming it up with me yeah thank god there's that bridge where you could breathe yeah exactly exactly <laughs> that's what he's did job. you uh to develop technique, um, I, I know I, I've heard you talk uh, about this before. You play a lot. You, you gig a lot. I try to play uh, as much as I can with as many people as I can. Um, we uh, in Wolfpack. Wolfpack's you know become more than just a band. It's become like a collective, like a, a community, really. And uh, it's pretty 
it's pretty incredible. Uh, it's just it's just happened so slowly and naturally that I didn't even really feel it happening in real time. But now, when I look at like the email thread, uh, the Wolfpack email thread, and the the list of recipients uh, in the email thread is just insane. It's like it's like a who's who. I mean, it's got you know Nate Smith on it. It's got it's got Bootsy Collins on it some s somehow. Um, but it's got, uh, you know, in addition to the guys in Wolf, such so many great guest um, artists that we've worked with. So, yeah, for me, part of what keeps me, like, feeling good on my instrument and feeling like I'm growing as a musician is, is playing with as many new people, as many amazing people, being constantly nervous to play with, you know, whoever it might be, whether it's, like, you know, Bernard Purdy or, like, or like Lewis Cole, I was just thinking like uh, uh, when, when I when I think of the dr like just purely the drummers that I've somehow gotten to play with via Volve, it's like truly surreal. So I'd say playing with good drummers uh, helps keep my strength and, and stamina up, you know. Right, and, and I mean the two cats in the band are wonderful too. Yeah, and they're yeah. like and they're really like one cat too, especially on on Dean Town. You know, one two two you know one one set of drums, two two drummers. But uh, yeah, Stratton and Katzman are both amazing drummers in their own right, which is amazing. Which is what's really incredible to me is how how uh, sort of egoless they are because they're constantly hopping off of the drum kit. You know, it's like Jack is equally happy to just stand on stage without an instrument and just kind of like point at people and call new sections. You know, <laughs> and and Katzman, Katzman's like th an, an incredible singer songwriter. And and could just do that, and maybe someday we'll we'll just be doing that and be known for that. But the fact is, he's an incredible drummer. You know, I don't even know if he considers himself a drummer anymore, or or what he considers himself to be. You know, but Stratton will be like, we're going to feature our drummer on this one, and then he's up at the front of the stage playing guitar and singing. You know, it's like yeah, there's our drummer doing his thing up there. You know. Yeah. Oh, it's crazy. Um, let's go back a little bit. Um, you you play trombone. Correct? When I, yeah, when I was a when I was a kid, my f um, I joined the the school band program. I guess in like fifth grade, and you had to choose an instrument. And my instrument there was trombone, which I ended up later uh, resurrecting for like a little brass section at one Wolfpack gig when we realized that everyone had played a brass instrument at some point. Stratton was playing a sousaphone, and I was playing trombone, and and Woody Woody plays some sax. Um, and uh, so anyway, yeah, it was trombone in school, it, but it was always bass at home. Like it was really the, f you know, for all, even though it may not have been my first instrument, I was, I, was, I was definitely forced to take some piano lessons when I was really young. But when I was about eight is when I remember the bass being present and uh, playing at home with my siblings, um, with my parents, and then uh, eventually with with uh, some kids I met at school and, and you know, luckily had a good, uh, good, you know, some good teachers and a good, and a good band uh, program at my, at my high school. So, yeah, I mean, the opportunity to play a lot, um, luckily, was there from a, from a young age, you know. It's funny that you mentioned um, that those piano lessons that you were forced to take. Yeah. How many of you had that piano teacher, <laughs> right? Now, you know what's funny about these glasses? I can't see. <laughs> That's why you do it. Yeah, okay. Um, but that's good. So you developed, um, I mean, you're no, str he's a Berkeley alum, people. Baselines he went weekend. Here. Baselines weekend. That yep. counts. And I, that counts. And, and, and yeah, and I did, um, I did, I did come really close to, to actually attending Berkeley as an undergrad. Uh, switched at the last moment, went to University of Michigan very fortuitously because it of course led to meeting all my my bandmates, meeting Stratton first you know, first semester I was there. And and uh and from there it just it just blossomed. But but I, I play with a I find myself constantly playing with Berkeley alums. And uh it's just it's an incredible like you know, it's not really network I I so much as just like it's bec it's it's seeded the music scene more 
broadly in the U.S. and the world. It's just like everywhere I go, I'm constantly yeah. That's great to hear. Berkeley kids, yeah. you know, and yeah. and uh, so it's yeah, it's an inspiring uh, thing. I'm I'm very uh, I do consider myself in some small way to be a Berkeley alum, and even more so now, having getting to hang here with you, and I just hung with Steve, and um, yeah, it's it's incredibly cool. That's beautiful. You're welcome here anytime. Thanks, man. We, we love you. I mean, be, uh, we listen to Wolfpack a lot around here. I do. Yeah. Thank yeah. You guys do? Yeah. One. Thank you. I promise. I promise to bring Wolfpack to Boston. I promise. I've, I've, you heard it. You, you, you heard it. You heard it here first. It's a promise. Awesome. Um, let's share a little bit about um, some of the teachers that, that you study with because um, I think that's kind of interesting. Um, talk about that. Jim. Yeah. Um, I was lucky when I was a kid to meet some um, really great bass teachers up in northern Michigan where I grew up. And uh, they had all played in bands, you know, when they were coming up. Like, one of my bass teachers was, was out in L.A. in, like, the early 80s. And when he found out I was a, a Chili Peppers fan as a teenager, he's like, oh, I used to, I used to see Flea. I used to see those guys all the time, like, opening up like playing with Fishbone and playing with all these like old school kind of early like punk funk like lo you know Angelino bands and uh, and so he you know this particular teacher that I had like really um, a couple of them really like fostered an interest in uh, in like funk bass playing but from from a young age like before I would have even years before I would have ever found a lot of these amazing bass players that I now really consider inspirations, um, like James Jamerson, like Verdine White, like Rocco Prestia, uh, those guys, um, I didn't realize I was hearing uh, at such a young age. At Stevie, Stevie Wonder too, left hand uh, bass stuff, I, I, I was hearing it when I was like, you know, 10 years old, 11 years old, taking lessons because these guys considered that to be the definitive bass music you know so they gave you that as homework Luckily, to listen to and they digest sent, they sent they sent me home with that stuff you know and uh and 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 i did have a chance to meet my hero flea well ve very briefly but first met him uh by writing a fan letter to him when i was really young i i, I remember my parents you know i must have been like 12 or something and my parents were like oh you love you love this guy flea you should write him a, a letter you should tell him how much you love his playing you know and uh and so i actually i actually did it i i i recorded i had my my buddy who was like a year or two older and had like a tape machine record me playing like some like flea stuff and uh it included it with a with a letter to him that i mailed and uh miraculously to i don't know how how he would have ever ever had time to do this, uh, and uh, it w how it would have gotten to him. But he ended up writing me a letter back, handwriting me back, and he said, you know, hey Joe, your playing sounds great. Keep it up. Um, you know, remember, remember. Here's my my words of advice for you. Rem remember that the bass is a supportive instrument. You're there to to serve the song. You're there to support the other musicians, except of course when you take the lead, which of course. I always was inspired by Flea because he could he could really he could really take the lead such a melodic bass player. You know, he said blah blah blah, keep it up, hit me up when you're in LA. PS listen to James Jamerson on Marvin Gaye's What's Going On record. You know, that was his those were his parting words, you know. It's kind of like listen to that, learn that, you'll be okay. Everything else will follow, you know? And he he was so right. He was so right. And I got to I got to I got to recently play that first half of that record with Joey Dosick. He did like a, as his encore for his show, he did the entire first half of what's going on. And so I actually, then, then I actually did have to learn it, you know, or sort of learn it, you know. And um, incidentally, we got in the studio with Joey to, to, to record that first half in Joey's arrangement with uh, James Gadson on drums, who's still yeah. <laughs> crushing it. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah, so some, in, it, somehow it feels like Flea was even like a, a teacher to me, even though I did only meet him once in passing when I went after the, or before the Berkeley, Berkeley Bass Lines camp, I went to the, the Flea Silver Lake funk uh, experience in LA when I was like 13, 
um, and he and he he sat in with us at the at the um, you know recital at the end on trumpet. He came out just out of the wings, out of nowhere. He was always just saw the, over there playing trumpet somehow, like and then bat dashed off before I. So yeah, I wouldn't maybe call it a meeting, but uh, wow. anyway, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Um, uh, your rhythm, your rhythmic concept, you you um, is beautiful. Uh, we work on that with everybody we uh, us teachers or students too we work on it every day you guys work on it every day you 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 uh you have so much energy and it's like right down the middle always Thanks, and um we talk a lot about subdivision here which we which we all feel you know how you're going to get from the beginning of the bar to the end of the bar and you have this way of moving your neck man that's like extraordinary. It's all in the neck, man. Some people say like it's oh, it's all in the fingers. It's like no, no, it's it's all in the neck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it, when did you realize that you had this neck thing going on? <laughs> you know, it turns out that that I was, uh, in some ways, destined to be a bass player, not because uh, you know I had some aptitude. Uh, musically as a kid or because like I had you know the finger dexterity uh, from a young age or anything none of that really predisposed me to the bass the thing that did was my neck muscle was somehow you know I don't know if some some genetic thing went went slightly wrong and and when I was a little when I was a little baby my parents told me this years after I started playing bass uh, that when I was a little baby, the first thing they noticed about me that was like abnormal and sort of worrying was was my neck muscle uh, allowed me as a as a as a one or two day old infant to lift my head up off of like the little table, the little baby room that all the babies are in. One baby strangely was was somehow lifting its little head up <laughs> off the, and that was me. So. I think it, more than anything, people ask, it's like, oh, yeah, what's in the fingers? Like, no, no, it's definitely the neck, uh, you know, timekeeping. Um, but that is, that is the time, that is one way that I keep my time, and, and, and I, do, I do really believe in, um, you know, a sense of time, uh, a sense of groove, um, sub constant, like, militant subdivision, you know? I, I really do consider that to be what really separates uh, something from, you know, sounding, sounding good, and and really feeling good, you know, and uh, and that's with Wolfpack. I think uh, a lot of the power comes from the fact that Jack and Theo and Woody. I mean, all, all those guys have just really great time, really great groove. And uh, as a bass player, I think it's um, maybe overlooked sometimes. M maybe it's uh, would be more the focus of. Of of drum lessons as a kid, but I think should be more the focus of of bass lessons as a kid is uh, developing great time, developing great you know sub subdividing and and never letting you know fills or or anything really get in the way of keeping that time right there and keeping it really feeling good and keeping it locked in you know with the kick drum. Yeah, well, you you certainly display that in all your in all your music, and and you you hit it off right here with with J K. Yeah, let's do yeah. Uh, let's, let's do, do another little groove. Let's do, do it. let's do one of those sixteenth uh, yeah. classic uh, kind of sixteenth note grooves that that Wolf has. We can groove on like the it gets funkier kind of thing. Uh, just a funk groove, but but part part of uh, I think where that comes from for me is is the is the Tower of Power, Rocco Prestia influence, where he's got these great, you know, de dead notes, muted notes that really like keep it, keep it charging ahead, you know? Um, yeah, so we'll groove on that.
John Keys. Yeah, bro. Yeah. Got a, got an email from uh, some from some of the professors in the drum percussion department. Check out John Keys. So I brought him to one Z, and I just went, and he did it. That's right. Yeah. Yep. I knew you'd approve. Got the power. You got the power. Yeah. Have you met Rocco? I never have. I, I would love to. Yeah. But a uh, huge, huge influence for me. Like, yeah, it's it's uh, fi finding your your voice on on an instrument is set. It, it, it's like something you you can't uh, you can't force. You know, you you can't. Uh, it's not something you can just like dis decide to do one day and just and just like oh, I'm, if, if I just uh, practice this and this. Uh, and this pattern and this figure every day, you know, I'll, I'll eventually, you know, I'll, I'll surely, surely very soon I'll have my voice on the instrument. It's like, it happens just very slowly and, and something that hopefully if you are listening to enough different stuff and you find what really speaks to you, hopefully then it starts coming back into your playing, but not in a way that you're just constantly, you know, qu like quoting or, co or copying. It's it's hopefully going to blend into something that eventually becomes your voice, and that that was what, uh, luckily I think over the years I've 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 taken something from from some of each of these bass players that really influenced me from a young age, like Rocco, like Verdine, like Pino, like Flea, and but 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 you know trying to figure out okay what do I what do I have to say what do I, what do I want to say what really um, you know sp speaks to me about each of those players, you know? That's, you, it's like a philosophical concept, but it's a beautiful thing, and it seems like you were steered towards honing Joe Dart as opposed to regurgitating this or that. that that's a beautiful uh, thing to share with us, and, and I think we just heard it, did we not? You sound like Joe Dart, man. <laughs> it's remarkable. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know. Um, I'd, I'd love to open it up to some of your, do you have any questions? Um, why don't we, uh, Thea and, now the problem with these glasses, Joe, man. Tough, right? Yeah. Dom and Thea, got somebody? We'll share this around. Hey, Joe Dart, how's it going? It's going great, how are you, man? Very good, had a wonderful day. So. Um, I wanted to ask you when you come up with licks on the spot, because I assume that you don't come up with them all beforehand and then go, oh, okay, this would be a good place for that. What percent of it would you say is trying to mess yourself up and then get out of it? That's my theory on how you <laughs> come up with licks. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's great to hear you say that because um, while it's not something that I – I, I don't think I, I was doing that until I found out that that's what Woody was doing to to himself. And he told me at one point, like I, 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 st I told him like, yeah, you know, I, I just, uh, I try to get, you know, I've been trying to like, you know, meditate before the gig or like turn my phone off, you know, just trying to get really in the zone and, and, and you know, really right there with it and be at one. And, and Woody's like, oh, I, I try to do the opposite, man. He's like, oh, I'm always trying to mess myself up, just get myself out of, like, out of the zone. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? You know, but really, he's, he, you know, Woody, Woody is, Woody's uh, like a true natural-born improviser. 
and the more you can throw him off, the better it's actually going to be. You know, he's the type of guy that that just shows up, and 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 just reacts. You know, um, and so I think I I I ended up taking some of that from him, and I was like, oh man, there's yeah, there's something to that. You know, there's something to like um, letting yourself be in a reactive zone rather than a like a planning zone. You know. And if if I think about it in the studio or or live, and I think like, okay, here comes this here comes this moment. I got this fill, you know, like which I'll catch myself doing sometimes. I'll be playing, and I'm like, okay, here it comes. I think I got an idea. Yeah, okay, that's gonna be sweet. I 100% of the time, whiff. I'm nail. I, I I miss it completely, and it ends up being, it ends up feeling like totally disjunctive because it's planned, and then you don't nail the actual thing you were hearing. So I, I really do. I appreciate that philosophically. Is just trying to. Uh, to get yourself in a real, true I- improvisational state rather than planning something. And uh, hopefully over time, the muscle memory gets you to a place where you can just react in real time. And uh, it also helps that Stratton never tells any of us what the hell's going on or what's, or what's about to happen, you know? Thank you. That's a great question. Thanks, Joe. So it's a real organic process when you guys make a record. Truly, what first you know, often the first take, first one, two, or or, or three takes are 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 where the magic is, where we're still learning the song, and uh, no one has time to plan anything. No one's played it enough to plan anything. You're still learning it, and that's I think where the magic happens. So yeah, when I l- go back and listen to some Wolf tunes, it's like well. You know, there's 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 plenty of mistakes, but there's also just clearly that magic of like, oh wow, that was the first time we did that. That was the first time we nailed that, or like you can hear the discovery in it, kind of. You know. That's great. Question over here. Hey, what's up? How's um, it going? Question about Wolfpack's writing process. So, like, how does it work? Does like, how are the parts created? Does does Jack give you like an outline, and then you come up with the parts yourself, or like? How does it work? Um, generally, we will go into the studio, which which is often uh, just a living room or a basement uh, or a porch, and um, Jack will play with maybe with maybe a griddle. Exactly. Or, yeah. yeah. Maybe. Griddle. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and uh, or 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 like a pillow or like a, a bed a bedroom with some pillows to play. I, I'm remembering some of the weirder. Uh, situations we put ourselves in in the studio um, and and each time it was kind of like uh, s- Jack will play uh, s- play something through on on keys really and then w- he'll sort of point us in the direction of what instrument he I- he envisions us on for a track and it's not always Jack like Woody's written a lot of like very definitive he's like he's like the secret weapon Woody's written a lot of very definitive uh, Wolf tunes um, and of course Theo, but a lot of the time it's Jack coming in, he'll play something on piano, play through a little chord structure. And then he'll be like, you know, Theo, I'm hearing you on drums for this or on guitar for this. And then he'll come over and show me like sometimes like a little bass figure that, that acts as sort of a hook, you know, like a, a bass um, hook, like, uh, you know, in like Conscious Club or something. Like that's like a Stratton kind of hook that he might have sent me years ago even. Um, and he'll never send out any demos. No one sends out any demos for the sake of keeping it really fresh. But yeah, we get in the room, and we just uh, we just learn it on the fly and kind of hit record, basically immediately. Um, and 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 sometimes get the magic even as we're learning it before we've even realized we're doing takes. And uh, yeah, that's that's. And then everyone's figuring out parts as, as we go. And sometimes sometimes it's really like okay, we, we should write like a little bridge section. Like I remember Woody. Uh, when we when we just recorded um, "Soft Parade" on the for the la- last album, and we were all sitting in the in the circle and grooving on it, you know, it was a great groove. It felt great, but Woody's like, oh, "It needs it needs something else. It needs a change. It needs like a little bridge." And then there was just like a little moment of silence, and then Woody all of a sudden just played, and just played these like four chords, you know. And I'm like, "Oh, what should I do on that?" And I'm like, "Maybe I'll just lay out for it." He's like, "Okay, cool," you know. And literally like 30 seconds later, it was like, "Okay, cool." hit record and so that's literally the the bridge of that tune now and it was just woody just like wait a minute 
boom, just pulling it out of the air. So like a lot of it, it really is writing on the fly. Um, and then you have to learn it at some point in order to play it live. Uh, so I've been learning slowly this latest record, learning it for uh, whenever we might go back on tour and, and hit this new stuff. So, Joe, where did you learn um, much about harmony? Did, did you have a particular teacher take from the one note at a time and stack them up and all of a sudden th these are what chords are? Where, can you go back to where you... I, I, apart from just really great uh, ear training, which came from my teachers sending me home to, uh, to learn stuff on my own and come back and kind of see if I had gotten it or not, um, I remember even as a young kid, like, you know, I don't know how old I was, maybe like seven or eight, um, my grandfather, who who was a musician, a great classical violinist named Israel Baker, who played um, in the studios in L.A. And, and ended up being kind of like a top top call session musician, which I only year really realized years later when I started to like delve into his all music and look at some of the records he played on. I was like, holy shit, man! It's you know, it's it's a it's a it's a lot of amazing soundtracks that John Williams. Uh, scores and the and the uh, Bernard Herman like uh, Hitchcock films. Um, his his it, he passed away like ten years ago, but it was one of the cool little lines in his obituary was that his uh, his claim to fame was was being the uh, shrieking violin in the uh, shower scene of Psycho. You know, re 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 re. Uh, so very 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 definitive. Some very definitive violin parts were played by him, but I, I didn't really know. I didn't realize that until years later. But he used to call me when I was a kid and uh, and quiz me. He he lived in L.A. I, I lived in Michigan, and he he would he would call me and he'd be like, "All right, are you are you listening? Are you near the piano?" And he would and I would go over to the piano and then and then he would go to his piano and he would and he would like play an interval and and he would he would quiz me on it. He'd be like, oh, "What is that? You know, what am I playing here?" And he'd play a chord. He'd be like, oh, "What's that? You know?" And and he was always incredibly uh, like like. It felt it felt demanding as a kid, like, like what do you expect of me? You know, I'm like se six years old, seven years old. But the thing is, he he was sort of a child prodigy and had perfect pitch and like was, and so I, don't, I think he was completely out of touch with you know what it what it might be to be like, you know, a little kid like casually thinking about like playing some music and like you know like joining the playing recorder at music class. I wasn't like destined to be some like child prodigy like he was, but he definitely um, not only helped with some early ear training, which I, did, I do not have perfect pitch, but uh, he, uh, it was fun hanging out with him because he did, and he would sometimes, when I was out in L.A. visiting him, uh, uh, like a car horn would go off, and he would be like, you hear that? And then he'd name all the notes that were in that car horn, you know, what, what, what d discordant uh, notes were. It was, really, it was really fun, but anyway, more than uh, just the music, purely musical stuff, he, he just really instilled the idea that, that um, you know that music was a was a real a viable career path. You know, and my mom growing up with him really saw what a, what being a professional musician can can look like. You know, you can be a totally r you know relatively functional person. You know, I mean he 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 was he was eccentric a as many musicians are, but he had like a f family and a home and was a working uh, musician in L.A. like n nine to five kind of thing. You know, um, so. Wow, that must have been really comforting for you to know that you didn't have to. I mean, uh, I, from speaking with, you've spoken with people too who their parents just don't accept the fact that, okay, but you'll get a real job sometime later. You didn't have that experience. Luckily, I was, yeah. luckily from a young age, it seemed like one of the things I could choose to do for my career someday would be to be a musician. That's you know? beautiful. And I feel very lucky to, have, uh, to be doing that now. We're lucky that you did it too. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Uh, question? Hi. Hey, you. Hello. Hi. Hey. Um, I, when I started watching your videos online, a lot of in all, in a lot of the videos you were using the J bass, but now I see that there have been a few different bases. I was wondering, how do you pick your bases? What do you really go for? Is it like a weight thing, the neck thing, or is it like 
oh, this is the bass I've been looking for my whole life kind of <laughs> thing. <laughs> this is it. This is the one. Uh, no, but uh, thank you. That's a great question. I, um, I got my Fender J bass when I was, it was my second bass that I got when I was learning bass. The first one was like a very cheap, uh, like Samic uh, bass that had like extremely high action and was just extremely unergonomic, if that's a word. It was terribly difficult to play, but I think helped me develop finger strength in a way it's like if I could play anything remotely musical on that then when I got to a bass that actually felt good uh, I sounded like I, I I could play the bass and, and eventually after two or three years of that uh, ceramic bass I got I got a Fender Jazz like just used in a, in a local music shop is a like Mexican made basically not exp not, a, not an expensive Fender Jazz bass but it was a real Fender uh, and it was my total go to axe it was the only one i owned for like many years and really only in the past two or three years have i acquired a couple more bases and part of it was stratton owns a little stable of bases that he would sometimes bring to a session because he thought that it would be particularly well suited to a song we were playing so you know maybe it was like the p P bass if we were doing a more Jamerson thing. And one fun bass he has, which he bought off my friend whose little brother used it when he was like seven or eight years old, is a P Junior. It's a jazz bass, or it's a, it's a Fender P bass Junior. So like not only short scale, but like short, short scale, tiny, which I play on uh, my first car. And uh, I think wait for the moment um, god damn i always and, thought that uh, was in the lens yeah right well it's good because in one of the you, <laughs> you'd be forgiven for thinking that because my head is also giant in one of them <laughs> uh, so you know you'd be you'd be forgiven for that's thinking great. it was a trick a trick of the light but um but uh that that you know that throws you into a different zone and i think playing that bass uh threw me into a different zone on those songs and ended up being somehow the right bass for those songs um and then jack owns this this uh, Carlo Robelli bass, uh, which might look familiar because this bass was designed after it, but his his Carlo Robelli bass, which had like flat wound strings on it, uh, I I would mess around on and ended up playing on a few of the kind of disco funk tracks of Wolf, including the first "It Gets Funkier" and "Daddy Got a Tesla," uh, among among others, and. Uh, so between a handful of the bases that Jack owns, we kind of started to be like, oh, this is this is the cool bass for this kind of tune. This is a cool bass for this kind of tune. And then uh, I really fell fell in love with that uh, Robelli bass that he that he had. And uh, eventually, when Jack and I uh, started to meet more people, kind of in the uh, industry and in the manufacturing side of the industry, uh, we met the guys at Music Man, and we told and 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 we started talking to them and. You know, we said like, there's, there's, there's. If we were ever gonna design something, an instrument, it would be like designed after this Robelli bass that we kind of envisioned as the ultimate like funk bass, the ultimate kind of like Bernard Edwards, uh, Music Man-ish kind of thing, and uh, that was what gave birth to this instrument, which we built with them, which is based on that bass. Just Jack calls it the single speed, uh, the single speed funk bass. It which just has a a volume knob and one pickup and is like totally kind of natural wood finish and just minimalist in every way kind of has that wolf minimalist ethos um and some flat wound strings and uh so increasingly this is like you know my my funk axe and it's, it's replaced the robelli um but uh yeah i guess long story short it's that it started to be that we could choose from among a handful of axes that we owned together and choose the right one for the song but then live, I started to use this bass more and more because it's brand new, and and they, uh, Music Man built it for me, and I said like oh, I'll try it out on the road, and it's been amazing. And so now, I'm, me and Jack are trying to convince them to uh, to build a few, few more, and have kind of a Wolf bass available, you know, some sometime. So is there just one Joe? Just one? This is one of a kind. One of a kind. Yeah. Yeah, you're killing <laughs> it. Wow. At the moment. Wow. Thanks. Thanks nice for the question. question. Um, hi, how are you? 
Uh, so with Wolfpack, you obviously play with a variety of different singers, and you guys do a lot of instrumental stuff. So my question is, does your playing style change depending on who's singing or whether or not there is a singer, or is that dependent on the song? That's a great question. I, I think it. Uh, I'm always trying to really serve the song, and, and uh, so that's why when there is actually a singer live, uh, it's it's much easier to do that. Like in the times when Antoine is in the studio with us or Theo's singing live, it's like so much easier to serve the song because you get the arc of it and you get, you know, you, you see where they're singing and where they're not singing and you see where their phrases are and you can bounce off of that and respond to that. Um, harder to do are the songs where I think it's an instrumental and then later, and then the, the whole time Jack knows it's not gonna be an instrumental, we're gonna add lyrics later, but he doesn't tell me. Uh, <laughs> And so, like, with Christmas in L.A., you know, that was just an instrumental track. And then uh, later, Theo wrote and added vocals. Um, and so hopefully the bass doesn't, like, you know, hopefully I'm not, like, pl like playing out in sections where it's like, why, why would you be playing out there? That's, like, this tender vocal moment, you know? Um, but, uh, but I think I do when, I, when it's an instrumental song. We all sort of, like, can see where the focal point would be. And it's like, and if there's not gonna be a singer, like maybe this is like a section where Woody kind of plays out a little bit or, or where the bass plays out a little bit. Um, and either way, I always try to kind of arc the tune. Um, and really like if there's, a, if there's gonna be a little bass moment, a little fill, a little lick, a little thing where I step outside the, the bass, the, the, the kind of hook of the bass line, it's usually that last chorus, you know, that very end part, which I always loved when bass players would do that in like pop songs, you know, like you'd be listening. Oh, it was to always on the radio. fade out. Yeah, always, always, Damn. exactly. Yes, to the point <laughs> where, fun. yeah. I remember when I was a, teen, when I was a teenager, uh, it must've like the, the iPhone must've come out like right, you know, when I was in high school and I had this idea for, a, for an app that would automatically bump up the volume of a song as it was fading out. And I was like, it's, gotta, no, it's gonna compensate for it and it's just gonna stay right there so you can hear all the cool shit that's happening. It was always at the end of the tune. I'd remember, I was, I'd be listening to like Steely Dan tunes or something and like the guitarist would be really starting to step out and then it was fading. It's like, oh, it wasn't appropriate for radio, you know, but I wanna hear it. Um, but yeah, so I, I think, you know, always trying to arc the tune, always trying to serve the song or hopefully things that are, that are present, whether it's an instrumental track or a vocal track. That's that's great that you mentioned the arc. We we had Tom Hamilton of Aerosmith in, and and folks were asking him as as was I. You know, is there like a magic formula to writing a song that's gonna be received by your fans yeah. really well? And he said, well, not not really, if, but 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 he certainly tries to create the arc. Yeah, the energetic arc of the song, and and that's true. Also, you know, I feel with with soloing, it has to do with just really, uh, you know building something that people can uh, latch, that their ear can, can grab, and then playing off that and stepping outside of that. But you can't really step outside without first building this fundamental song. And that's even how I think about soloing, is like when I'm, when I'm playing a solo, I'm also like, a lot of the time, I'm keeping, I'm keeping time like uh, whether the drums are there or not, you know, the, the, the ghost notes really keeping time and really building on, like building a figure slowly and then playing off that and playing uh, against that, you know? Um. That's great. Yeah, it, that reminds me, one time John Clayton, the bass god and arranger, um, was, was here and uh, he said, um, you know, you're never really playing by yourself. That's what I just got from you describing that. And he, he, he's on his upright and he starts playing the first little bit of Bye Bye Blackbird. Do, 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 do. Of course, everybody in the audience sang the next line, you know? So yeah. it, it, it's like that. That's a great way to think. Yeah. And um, y your music seems to flow like that um, beautifully. That's why it's so, so exciting for everybody to listen to it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, c I could keep asking, just one or two more from you guys. And um, when you're creating, over here, when you're creating a bass line or like a bass part, do you think about note length or is it something that just comes naturally? Note <laughs> length? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think one thing that really makes uh, the, the, the part of the power of, of a lot of the Wolf uh, 
recordings and live is that everyone um, in the band is very, very sensitive to to note duration. Like Katzman, Katzman in particular is uh, he'll like fall over, like fall over physically when when Woody uh, c cuts off a note at the re at the perfect at the perfect moment. You know, that's like what really gets him. You know, it's like oh. You know, there's there's a real power to, uh, to, you know, every nuance of the n way you play a n note down to when you cut it off. Uh, that uh, that I think really, those are like the intangible things, you know, and especially when everyone in the band is really on that is on that level. Um, that's where I think it r the real power comes from. So yeah, when I play with guys like Woody or, or drummers like Jack and Theo, it's it's kind of like the nuances and these really subtle things are like we're locking in on them and it's it's sort of unspoken at this point, which is which is what feels really good is to play with g people that you don't even have to talk about uh, things like that and, and subtleties like note duration. You just, you're all, someone will be a little bit off and they'll be like, oh, that's how we're doing it? Okay. And then it's just like that, you know? Um, so yeah, I definitely I definitely do think about it. Also, with all the bass players that, that you've already mentioned, like um, Bernard Edwards, mm. Verdine White, yeah. it really speaks to me, the, the variation of note length within us, within their hits. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. So Earth, Wind, and Fire, for sure. Yeah. So that's in your vocabulary. Yeah. Um, yeah. If there's any other uh, thing, like a little bit of a tune or anything, Wolf tune that anyone would want to hear too we can hop this in. guy's always into playing i love that yeah can i um, ask one thing though before we get john back up here some um because i know folks wanted me to ask you about it in terms of business and and the successes that you guys have had on the internet and sleepify <laughs> can you just talk about sleepify for a minute i remember uh very clearly when Stratton called me up and told me about the idea of Sleepify and uh I was terrified I was I was I was terrified I thought I, I thought for sure that that this was the beginning of the end for th for the band like you know <laughs> Str like Stratton but it was in the beginning so somewhat or I mean yeah yeah I mean it, right 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 like maybe it would like kill the band before we ever had a chance to uh <laughs> attain any real success like we we it was pretty early on and uh stratton you know he's always been a hacker he's always from from the moment i met him you know i realized he had this real subversive uh quality where he he was always trying to hack the system and 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 like uh, really across that's the what board. it takes i guess yeah across the board and when he called me and told me uh you know i got this this idea uh that uh you know because he he was thinking a lot about the royalty structure of S Spotify <laughs> you know and he was thinking a lot about how um you know just just how screwed musicians are getting by the streaming economy uh and how how could you uh either a rig <laughs> rig up something to to actually somehow make money f from the streaming and at the same time, really kind of make a statement about it and uh, kind of draw attention to it. And so Jack's brilliant protest was to game the system. And uh, evidently before Sleepify, it hadn't occurred to Spotify that someone could just put up one of their songs and play it on repeat. And uh, and that's that was his idea. And he, s he, he said, um, yeah, we're going to ask people to, to, uh, to, to s I'm going to put out a silent album. And uh, each song is going to be 31 seconds long because it only registers a, as a play a after 30 seconds. So if you play a song for like 10 seconds and then skip it, it doesn't register as a play. That person doesn't get paid. So it has to be 30 seconds to, to register as a play. So he made all the tracks 31 seconds. And he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask everyone to, uh, to stream this record while they sleep. Uh, it's going to be called Sleepify. And then we're going to uh, we're gonna, we're gonna go on a, a, a... I don't remember if the tour was initially the vision, but he, we were going to go on a free tour uh, subsidized by this, and we were going to go to all the cities where the people f streamed the album while they were sleeping the most. Um, but where I thought it would really go wrong is I, I, I was sure there would be a lawsuit uh, brought uh, uh, against us by Spotify. You know, I was sure we were gonna in violation of 
some some term of theirs, uh, and that we would get banned from Spotify <laughs> forever, um, and all and also that maybe that 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 we would only ever be known for this uh, stunt, you know, like we'd be a little footnote, you know, and we we did we did get a lot of press from it, and I thought like, well, this is even worse now that it's really taken off, you know, now we're really just going to be the Sleepify band, <laughs> luck. Luckily, uh, you know, we also happen to make s music that people checked out uh, as a result of the Sleepify thing. They maybe heard about Wolfpack through Sleepify, but then they might have checked out a record or two and really liked it. So luckily, it, it did end up kind of being a stepping stone. We did go on the free tour. It was awesome. It was an amazing experience. Spotify did shut it down. They did pull the plug. Uh, they did sort of blacklist us for a moment. Uh, but uh, you know, it kind of all worked out. We, uh, you know, we gained some fans from it. We had some fun, and uh, and and Jack's and Jack's always been a real music business uh, kind of maverick. He he's always been uh, fiercely independent. You know, so, uh, uh, Wolfpack's always been uh, independent. Ha has never has never uh, aspired to uh, a record contract. Um, have always been kind of DIY, and that comes from Stratton. That's his ethos. And the thing is, you don't have to be a huge band to be successful and make a living if you own every if you own the rights to everything, if you don't have to split the money with a million people and a record label and this and that, you can actually make your small you know, living as a as a as a career musician by having like a s relatively small but dedicated fan base who come out to your shows and listen to your records and so yeah, I mean, I feel very lucky that apart from being in a band with some amazing musicians, I'm also in a band with an ama amazing business mind that is Jack Stratton. Um, I you, you gotta, you should get him here to do a thing that's a music yeah. business program or something oh like. Yeah, that you would know, be great. He's uh, yeah. So he's inspiring uh, to to everyone in the band who has their own solo uh, things as well. To like, oh yeah, remember, you know, you don't have you you, you don't. You know, you can you can kind of do it yourself now, and we we're an, we're an internet band, uh, if that means anything. And uh, so, yeah, we, we we you know own it yourself, do do your own thing. You That's know. fantastic, Joe. Whose idea was it behind the um, the Jamerson? Yeah, the visual. Yeah, uh, yeah. S That's a Stratton video uh, concept, and in fact, Jack has always been a YouTube uh, kind of artist, which makes perfect sense. And he did. Uh, visualizing Jamerson uh, bass lines, which are really incredible. He also did this thing called The Sound of Two, where he puts uh, two completely disparate uh, video clips of, of musicians playing together and makes it sound like it, they're playing with each other. Um, it's totally mind-blowing. And uh, yeah, there was one, the, I think it was Corey Henry and Bernard Purdy, uh, which was my personal favorite. Although the, yeah, there was a good, uh, like, Michael Brecker and Steve Jobs one, I think, <laughs> too, at some point, but uh, <laughs> naturally. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a Stratton. He, he's you know he, give, he's a good follow. Give him a, give him a follow on you on YouTube. You know, apart from Wolfpack, uh, he's got a lot of really great uh, muso visual concepts. Yeah. yeah. And um, you're the youngest guy in the band. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. And th they all finished University of Michigan. We all we all met at University of Michigan. Uh, I left school early to go on tour and s sort of never stopped touring and thus sort of never went back to school. But, uh, but you know, uh, people will ask me, you know, like h how important is it to go to music school? Um, you know, is, is, this, is this the key to being a s uh, you know, successful like musician or a professional musician? And I don't know whether it is or isn't, but I, I can say that for me personally, uh, it was, even if it wasn't the degree, it was the chance meeting of all of these people that went on to be my m my bandmates and, and, and best friends. You know, if I hadn't gone to University of Michigan Music School at this particular time, uh, I wouldn't am, I wouldn't have met any of them, and that that made that made all the difference. You know, so I really do value that when I think about going to music school, going to a place like Berkeley. It's like it's as much, if not more, about the people you meet there, uh, the people you play with there, and the connections you make uh, than anything else. You know, that to me is the real power of it. Well, that's great to hear. That, that's the networking, right? Yeah, that deserves 
applause. Great stuff. Well, I know you need your fix because you haven't played in 15 minutes. That's right. I love the way you play, man. Thanks, uh, man. John, you're around? Should we groove on, on yeah. one more thing? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So, Is this all request options. hour? <laughs> <laughs> what did I hear? Con Conscious Club, Dean Town, my first car. <laughs> Dean Town? Do a little <laughs> oh, deep cut. Maybe Dean Town. Yeah. That's a great. Oh, we're good. Oh, yeah, we're good. Um, can I just ask you about some of those lines? Did, did did they come out first time out? Is that like you talk about? I'm gonna give you on Dean Town. Dean Town. <laughs> Dean Town was the far and away the most challenging Wolf session that I've ever done. Woody Woody sent me that that bass line on uh, like MIDI MIDI and and he he had he had. He You're thought, kidding. yeah, no, no. He he oh. thought like, um, you know, we need to do like a we need to do a bass. You know, we haven't done like a bass feature in a couple albums. You know, like we had done Beastly, but then we hadn't done a bass feature in a little while. You know, and uh, na naturally the 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 Teen Town influence. But at some point, uh, w by the way, they, they I don't know when, but Theo started calling me Dean at one point, which is a which is comes from a long evolution of, of, of nicknames. But anyway, it's, it's too too long to get into, but at some point it landed on Dean. Uh, hence the name, Dean Town. And uh, Wo Woody uh, sent that out. And I remember like spending all night like the night before, like late into the night, like shedding shedding that for the for the session the next day. You know, because I wanted I wanted to be able to to like nail it. I didn't want to have to do a bunch of takes. Like I thought like, oh yeah, I'll show Woody. I can play this and you know. And uh, it was incredibly uh, challenging. And uh, you know now playing it live with the band is uh, 
as much a, an audience participation uh, moment as anything <laughs> else. They sing know? the whole thing with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dub Dublin, Ireland was was uh, the, this, it was the soccer crowds that uh, really brought it, uh, and and it started to be that way uh, everywhere else too. But uh, yeah, it's 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 fun, man. I try. I, I uh, yeah, keeps me keeps me limber, and uh, it's fun Completely. playing with. I mean, Katzman and Stratton like the dual. To 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 you know one one set of drums and, and, and one lampshade for Theo like oh. in the you know <laughs> and I I saw the clip from with Chris Teal the other night that was beautiful yeah unbelievable uh, experience to play with Chris yeah I mean a big a big uh, you know looking looking at the last few years of of, of of Wolfpack kind of becoming like a little bit more of a real band that goes and goes on tour and plays shows you know because we started really as a studio band. Uh, getting to play with these musicians that I've looked up to and listened to and admired for so long uh, and then finding out that they then dig what we do uh, is is the highest honor and one of the craziest experiences imaginable. Like Chris Thiele, like, you know, I mean, there's n nobody plays like him. You know, he's such an incredible musical mind and uh, it was sort of like full circle that Stratton used to like introduce everyone on stage during the Wolf shows like basketball style you know and uh, like and from Harbor Springs Michigan you know but then he'd be like he'd be like we're, we're gonna feature our bass player on this one he's the Chris Thiele of funk bass you know like he was saying that like years ago you know like six seven years ago and like now you know we played with the Chris Thiele of mandolin you know Chris Thiele and uh, it was, yeah, it was incredible. And, and uh, I got, you know, yeah, just this past weekend playing with uh, that that band now that, that Thiele has, uh, Mike Elizondo, uh, like, MDing, and Matt Chamberlain was on drums, and uh, all these, you know, some of the Punch Brothers guys. And then, like, the L.A. heavyweights. Yeah. And the rock scene. True, yeah. true heavyweights. It was amazing. And, of course, Chris Thiele, like, he just lights you up, like yeah, I mean, he's just an amazing person. In addition to to, to his playing, you know, and uh, and uh, after the show, I was talking to Matt Chamberlain. I was like trying to keep my cool, you know. I was just, you know, cool musician dudes hanging out, you know, chill, pretty pretty chill. But we were all free, we were all freaking out because these guys are are our heroes, you know. And and Chamberlain, Matt Matt Chamberlain said to me like, uh, Hey man, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't want to tell you. Uh, you know, before your your big bass feature, but uh, John Petitucci was in the audience tonight. You know, and I'm like, you're kidding me. He's like, he's like, actually, he's uh, he's right there. You know, I turned around and John Petitucci, how are you? You know, so I met, I met, I met. And they John, all know who, John Petitucci because he he's here. You know, you got you got an incredible incredible uh, uh, faculty here, and uh, so anyway, getting to meet uh, some uh, some of the great bass players that I've always looked up to. As well as drummers and other and other musicians, uh, is is one thing that that keeps me. I I just I'm just so grateful for it. It's 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 every time Wolf goes on tour, we seem to somehow find ourselves in the midst of uh, of some ins <laughs> of some insane yeah. room of of players. You know, Joe, how did how did the Michael Bland sessions come about? You that all know that one. Yeah, in fact, I had I had Victor Wooten uh, in a class, and I I told him about Michael Bland and and showed him the track. He he had he didn't know about it. Serious? He knows oh Michael Bland God. from Janet Jackson yeah. and all this stuff. Incredible. Yeah. Well, well, uh, Corey Wong, uh, who is you know part of Wolfpack, came came up in the Minneapolis funk scene and was always uh, you know basically like print like Prince, the the Prince effect is so real in Minneapolis like you can really feel it there and you it's palpable you know like his his shadow his influence and uh, Corey came up playing uh, kind of this Minneapolis funk this Prince kind of lineage is just in the blood and he ended up um, playing with a lot of Prince's uh, f past and present band band members uh, just because that's 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 who <laughs> apparently just plays at clubs on any given night in, in Minneapolis. Uh, and uh, so uh, actually Corey said that one time 
When, and Prince Prince would, would just show up places in Minneapolis. And Corey said that uh, one time Corey was playing at uh, at Bunkers in, in uh, Minneapolis, which is where I first met Corey and where I, where I first saw Michael Bland, the Bunkers jam. Uh, uh, funky and low volume, uh, and and uh, and so, <laughs> so uh, pr uh, Corey was playing guitar there in the band, and he was at one point like mid solo, like just shredding, you know, mid mid solo, eyes eyes closed, just really channeling, you know, and uh, he feels like something on his hand on his hand, like he's kind of at the front of the stage playing a solo, and he kind of feels like someone like, t like t something like touching his hand. And he like kind of comes to and kind of looks down, and it's Prince handing him a five dollar bill, <laughs> like you know, <laughs> like just you know, good good job. Here's a five, you know, um, and that kind of shit just apparently happens in in Minneapolis. Um, but uh, yeah, Bunkers is where I first saw Corey and where I first saw Bland, and then Corey hooked us up with Michael Bland, and we went uh, into his studio, and uh, I mean. No, a, a, a truly one of a kind drummer. Like I, like I've luckily gotten to somehow gotten to play with, like I really feel like gotten to play with some of the great drummers alive. And he, and he, and and he's one of them. And his 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 groove and his time are so solid. And I really love that track because it's like it's like a feature. It's like a drum feature, but he like doesn't. It's like the anti chops. You know, it's just like here's the feature. Boom, boom, ka, boom, boom. Boom, boom. You know, it's, n it's, he's doing nothing except just laying down <laughs> just the perfect groove, the perfect time, every fill in time, you know. And his drum solo is amazing, too. But it's like, it's not like a chops thing. It's like a crazy, like, displacement, like, thing where it just lands at the end and feels so good. Um, That's a beautiful tune. Uh, man, it was, it was so much fun. Yeah, so. Was that a first take? I don't think we did more than... Two, yeah. two, uh, yeah. We just, we just hit it, you know. And and he didn't know what, what we were gonna play, of course, because that's the Stratton, uh, you know. That's that's the Stratton way, you know. Like keeping keeping musicians in the dark uh, about what uh, is about to happen is 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 what Stratton. Well, that's that's best, interesting. You know? <laughs> you know, it seems that's the way you guys operate. But everybody in 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 the core band has done so much preparation that, that you're ready to do that. Right. And, and we all here 24 seven work on preparation that's it. is, is, uh, that's it. You hear he said, it. I mean, really, yeah, <laughs> I, I do feel that like part of, uh, what, um, the reason that it can be fun and the reason that it, it, it is, it, that it's magical, uh, to, um, to have these experiences where no one knows what's going to happen is because everyone has, been preparing basically for that moment you since know, you had that forever. piano teacher exactly yeah. that's right yeah. you know I, I mean a guy like Woody that I was talking about throwing himself perfectly uh, pr you know, purposefully throwing himself off is because he is because he's practiced so he's devoted countless hours and years of his life uh, to to uh, to sort of being at one with this instrument in a way that like I, I you know, kind of never seen before. Like that's really, I feel the level that Woody's on. I mean, he just he just spent countless hours as a kid in middle school, in high school, in college, just locking himself in practice rooms, and and now he's to the point where it's just like, y you know, y you just just throw him, just just put wo sit Woody somewhere at a at a keyboard, you know, and just and it'll be magical, you know, and it, it feels that way. Getting together with all of these musicians is just like okay, everyone clearly has has put in the work. Uh, and uh, and I, I feel very lucky when I sometimes I just like catch myself thinking like in the studio or on stage I'm like I can't believe I get to play with with these people you know wow, this beautiful. is unreal you know just like the, the the amount of work and like heart and soul that all of these people have put in you know to 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 this to music and to this and to their instruments for their like their whole lives basically like what a man what a privilege do you all live in different parts of the country now we do we 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 um, we we very briefly lived in the same place when we joined when we when we formed in Ann Arbor, but pretty s pretty shortly thereafter because everyone was graduating, we all kind of moved away. And luckily, it's never it's never gotten in the way of of of, uh, of the band. In fact, I think it's it's been helpful. I think it's been helpful to um, to have this uh, this distance 
and this and this uh, real freedom outside of the band, and 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 it really makes it special when we do get together. You know, I mean, Jack, Jack and Theo are out in L.A. Woody's in Chicago. Corey's in Minneapolis. Uh, I'm pretty much on the road, but I'm sort of in New York. Uh, Antoine's in Michigan, uh, and we just kind of get together. Uh, a and when we do get together, it's really special. It feels like a reunion. It feels like a reunion every time. You know, it's like, can't believe we, g we get to do this? Like, wow, we're getting the band back together. This is amazing. Right, you know? Right. Like the Blues Brothers. It's great, yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's really a treat every time. And uh, so, yeah, maybe, yeah, it, it seemed, it's working. How, so how long was that European tour? Um, well, we've done a couple uh, of, like, two-week tours and uh, – I just did a three-week one with Joey, um, and uh, you know, the first time we we took the band uh, uh, overseas, it was like a real, uh, it was like scary. We didn't know, we didn't know if we might have gotten in over our heads. Like, can we really go play in like London? Can we go go play in in France? Like, and it turns out, like again, power of the internet. You know, I think Wolf, uh, you know, we've somehow got a little bit of a world sm small small club of of people the world over who, who are, you know, who dig Wolf, so. Uh, it's sold out everywhere, It's right? wild, wild experience, yeah, totally, ama totally amazing, and each city's different. Uh, I trust Boston will be a, a pretty damn good one when we finally get here. Uh, oh, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, how I know you sold out everywhere is you have someone very close to you who, who, is, who, who is just. That's right. Your big campaigner. Who, who was at God. every single show, and that's my mom. Uh, my, my, my mom, uh, was that's why Joe's here. Literally. Uh, yeah. actually, I well, wouldn't literally. be, it wouldn't be, but it, uh, that is literally why I'm here, but it wouldn't <laughs> yeah. be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if, if you had said like, there was one person who was at every show and then all of a sudden I like saw like someone waving in the back and it was my mom who had surprised me and shown up. Wouldn't surprise me, but she, she, uh, she, she, when I was really young was, uh, was dead set on, on, on getting me out to see as much live music as uh, I possibly could and s and sneaking me into um, to shows that were <laughs> 21 plus when I was you know 12 or 13 and uh, and then eventually you know dri driving me all over so I could play gigs before I could drive myself and 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 now uh, you know she's she and the parents of the other members of Wolf are uh, are among our biggest fans who who have uh, traveled to see us in uh, such far-flung locales as Paris and uh, Berlin and uh, and you know it's fun it's of course w when when we play LA like she's from LA it's fun for her to to go back and see us in these uh, clubs that she grew up seeing bands in you know like we played the troubadour with Joey and Theo and she was there and it was just like a really uh, amazing moment so yeah I, I thank her for uh, you know help helping foster my uh, musical education and, and career and and uh, and also being so supportive and helping me, uh, helping helping actually put us in in contact here. Yeah, yeah. Please thank her. Because Danny couldn't get through to me, but evidently could could. Uh, you know, my mom is very active <laughs> uh, on social media, evidently, and sort of the de facto yeah. head. Thank of God, the Wolf people our fan age club. are active on social yeah, media. Yeah, Well, yeah, exactly. To get in touch Fa with you guys. Facebook would have been gone a long time ago otherwise, I think. So yeah, she's she's sort of the <laughs> fan fan club. Uh, one of the fan club reps, so yeah, I do thank her. I, I also have to thank um, a former student and good friend, Dave Barron, who's not here right now, but he's, he's in New York. But he saw, uh, I, I must have transcribed one of your lines in one of our classes, and I put it up on our Berkeley Base Department Facebook page, and someone said, why don't you get Joe Dart to come to school? And I wrote, I've been messaging him on IG, but he doesn't seem to respond. <laughs> And then he said, why don't you try his mom? So I did, and the rest is history, brother. It's, it's <laughs> now we're putting it out there. Now everyone can get in touch with me. Just to reach out to my mom. Yeah, if you can find his her. mom, you're yeah, good. that's right. Well, yeah, thanks for, for uh, per, you know, uh, persisting because uh, it, it is really, uh, it, it's, it's truly an honor to be here at, at Berkeley. I mean, I, I, uh, I, fa I really uh, fantasized about going to Berkeley when I was a, a, a kid for, for many years, and even though it didn't end up, happening you know for undergrad for me I, I do uh, I do really really admire uh, this school and everything that uh, that it that it is and stands for and and does you know it's really amazing so oh thanks thank you guys man thank you very much for that yeah um,
How about w one more tune with, with John? You want to come yeah. up with something? And That'd be great. John Keyes, big hand for him. Yeah, You're wonderful. Um, should we do uh, one of the other tunes that people were uh, calling out? Conscious Club. Somebody say "Welcome to Wolf." Jeez, forget. No, no way do I know. No way do I still know how to play that one. Um, oh yeah, deep. Maybe, uh, maybe between Conscious Club and uh, My First Car, one of those two. Let's do it. Uh, yep, four on the floor thing. Let's do, yeah, let's do Conscious Club. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, John. <laughs> Crushing that. Hey, Joe, do you, did you early on have, a, have a, some sort of warm-ups that you did, something that, that helped you build your chops? Um, before I had uh, a long list of great drummers to play with, I played with a drum machine uh, with a metronome, but as soon as I had one that, that worked at all, a drum machine. Uh, and a and a and a looper pedal, um, and uh, I was telling Danny actually like uh, I, I I had this m uh, instructional DVD uh, just called it was just called Slap Bass, uh, <laughs> perfect, and it was still in the heyday of instructional DVDs, and uh, I remember my brother got it for me. He said I hope I hope it'll be you know good, and and I already had one instructional DVD that I adored, which was Flea's instructional DVD with Chad, such a classic. Oh. Amazing. I think it's up on YouTube. Or maybe it was Chad's. They both had it. Uh, instructional DVDs that were really hilarious and amazing. Um, but uh, anyway, this guy named Ed Friedland had, had an instructional DVD. And it later turned out, I discovered, actually I discovered this when I auditioned for Berkeley, that Ed Friedland taught at Berkeley. So, you know, another Berkeley connection for me. I guess I sort of learned to slap and learned uh, the power of like the sampler, the loop pedal, 
and the drum machine from uh, from Ed because he was just in a studio. It was just him and his bass and like this little drum machine thing and this little looper pedal, and uh, he would just lay down these these grooves and then kind of solo on top of them. And um, I remember checking that out when I was really young, and I was like, oh, cool. I guess I don't I don't need to find anyone to play with. This is great. You know, just sit alone in my basement with my looper pedal and my drum machine. Um, so I do think the positive side of that is that when I was playing all those hours with a drum machine, working on grooves, and then looping myself to, to find some cool bass lines to then solo on top of, uh, I, I, I was able to develop pretty good time and groove that would serve me then later when I would be playing with drummers. Or when I would be playing uh, those sections of the Wolf tunes where the band drops out or when it drops out and it's just kick or something where like if I didn't have good time it would just fall apart you know the, the, the song would slow down or or, or, the, or the tunes where I'm in charge of, of starting the tune you know things like that that I feel like are central to the role of being a drummer drummers should should feel you know very confident about the time for those reasons because they have to start off tunes and whatever I feel like equally equally important as I was saying before for bass players so um yeah, I can definitely recommend both, you know, spending some quality time with a with a drum machine as well as a great a great drummer if possible. That's fantastic. Uh, on that note, um, Marcus Miller spent a week with us some years ago. Were any of you here for that? No, I guess it was a couple years ago. I get my years mixed up, but anyhow, it was a good time and and um, it was fantastic. And he said when the Lindrum and the Oberheim DX kind of came into play, it wiped out three quarters of the people who thought they could do sessions. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sure. Beca because, because of this precision. Yeah. Um, I think earlier you said, I believe in militant subdivisions. But that, that'll get you, that'll get you oh, yeah. uh, straight up. Yeah, yeah, and the drummers that I really love are truly militant <laughs> about the subdivision. I mean. Mm you watch Bland, you know, you, you listen to his playing, Michael Bland, and it's just, here's where it is, and it's never leaving, and it's it's right there, you know, and another one of my favorite drummers we were talking about earlier today, uh, Jeff Percaro from Toto and like a, a million records, including um, the Steely Dan sessions, the, the Dan, who I love, and uh, Michael McDonald, uh, Keep Forgetting, Un Unreal. Uh, yeah. It's a cut and uh, anyway, just the the drums feel so good on on that, and I think uh, you know he's one of those drummers who come. Oh, and Garibaldi. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a little like like my short list of of drummers that I truly love because the track feels so good, and it took me years to figure out who they were. I just knew I loved that song or that artist, and it's like, oh, well, I think the reason you love it is because it's Jeff Ricaro or it's Steve Gadd or it's Garibaldi or whatever, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, so just being that hardcore about the time and the groove is something that uh, drew me to certain drummers, but then I later realized, like, oh, yeah, that's e equally important as a bass player. As Do you ever get behind the kit? No, not if I can help it. I mean, I, I, I can't. Stratton says I can. Strat Stratton's like, oh, yeah, you can do it, man. Like, you know, you, you could, because you know, Stratton, <laughs> I told the story recently to somebody that, that, um, that Stratton, uh, informed me that I was actually a drummer, not a bass player, but I, I was a drummer. The first time we played together. Yeah. The first time Jack and I ever played together. Jack was <laughs> shouting. He was on the drum kit. I was on the bass. We were in his basement in Ann Arbor the first time I met him, and he was shouting over himself and all of us, you're a drummer, you're a drummer. You know, <laughs> like, what does that mean? You know, but, but, but what he meant was, like, you, you have good time. You, have, you yeah. have good groove. You don't need uh, me as a drummer to, like, keep, keep, keep the groove going, stay on top, you know, the bass, the bass is locking in and it's right there, you know, so maybe that's what he meant. I, I can only, we can only guess at what he meant, <laughs> but, uh. Oh, man. Um, I want to ask you one question. We haven't gone there, um, about health maintenance, both, both your hands and mentally mm -hmm. and keeping your heart in shape, all of that. H how do you do it? How does the band do it collectively? Yeah. Talk about that. I mean, it's, it can be really, uh, you know, you can if you're spending a lot of time on tour, which the past few years I have, it's easy to fall into uh, a state of you know various uh, un unhealth and unwellness. You know, uh, because y you might not be sleeping very much, 
you're driving all day, playing late into the night. Uh, maybe you're, uh, you know, luckily n no one in my crew, no one I know, no one in my band do has ever done any drugs or anything like that. And I think it's really important to, uh, you know, to remember uh, that uh, music is a, is a lifelong, hopefully going to be a lifelong uh, pursuit and, uh, and we're in it for the long run, you know. So luckily there's no real self-destructive behavior, but there is just the simple fact that you got to take care of yourself and, uh, you know, I try now to, uh, you know, just, I mean, it's basic stuff. Get, get enough sleep somehow, if you can. Uh, hydrate, which I haven't been yeah. doing. I Joe, got have a hit. Bottle. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, I got you. I'll hold my cup. The guys in Wolf, like, uh, have started taking, like, uh, <laughs> great, great leaps uh, forward in, in health and finding ways to uh, exercise on the road. Jack is a militant vegan now. He thinks that's going to be the, the secret to longevity mm -hmm. uh, as a musician, which I can't understand for the life of me. No, but I, I, <laughs> I, um, I, I think uh, we've, all, we've all taken steps towards um, just, just trying to, like, live a life that uh, is, is balanced. I guess I think that's that's what it comes down to. Like I think it's it can be really hard as a musician to live a, a life that feels balanced because uh, you know things are not necessarily set up for the career of music. Like it's it's sort of uh, you got to figure it out as you go. There's not like a real rule book. There's not uh, a real. There's not a ton of people. Uh, maybe you know, it's different when you go to a great like music school hopefully you can be around people who can be um, mentors in, in how to live like a balanced uh, life as a musician and not like burn out and get get weirded out by what a strange path it can be you know because it is a strange it is a strange path you know and, and it's uh and it's it, it can be fraught with with peril and you can get weird about like uh you know whether it's like fame or, or lack thereof, you know, whether it's like, are you, um, what are you supposed to do? What does being a successful musician look like? You know, you can get a, like really weird about it and then you can get yourself into a thing where you're just like gigging constantly and not giving yourself enough time to, to recover and live a healthy life or like wearing earplugs. Like that was like, a, that was a thing that, that dawned on me at some point. Like, oh yeah, okay. Yeah, I could think about wearing earplugs, which I luckily do now when I'm when I'm gigging. Um, but uh, yeah, just stuff that 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 will allow you to do this thing for your whole life. Like I was because it's so much fun. Because it's so much fun. Yeah. I told I told you earlier. My like my grand my my grandfather, you know, the violinist. He he he, re he retired when he was 87, I yeah. think, 80 87 or 88. Like retired. Like by which I mean like he was still playing sessions when he was 86, 87, 88. You know. It's a it's a real lifelong thing, um, and uh, you know it's something that I I do. Uh, it's what I always wanted to do, and it's what I always want to do. I, I can't imagine myself doing anything else, and I'm sure it'll take m many twists and turns and be different versions of what I'm doing right now. But uh, you know, yeah, when it comes to remaining he healthy and staying balanced, it's to me sort of in service of getting to keep on doing this thing. You know. That's fantastic advice. But I know from, from our first emails and texts and our phone calls, you know, we address each other. Joe! Exclamation point. And you write me back. Yeah. Danny! <laughs> Three exclamation points. I'm, I'm with you, man. In, I'm well, yeah, and enthusiasm goes a long way. I learned that from uh, playing with guys like, like Theo Katzman, who is, uh, <laughs> I remember his, twi his Twitter bio just saying enthusiast. Uh, <laughs> He really that's is. That's great. He's, I want to follow him. Yeah, truly. I mean, that's what he does. You know, he plays many instruments. He wears many hats. He's a he, he's great at many things, but he uh, ultimately is an enthusiast uh, of of life. Really, you know. And I, I hope to be some measure of that. <laughs> you know. Oh, you've shared that with us, for sure. That's beautiful. Um, one or two more questions before we before you guys got to study for your finals. I get that. Yeah. Hi, um, I was a I was actually going to ask. Um, I know you guys just touched on it a little bit, but you know, since you you said since you since you were young, like 
you know, you were, okay, I'm going to be, I think I want to be a musician, and your parents really facilitated that. Um, now, you know, you're touring, you talked about the health and stuff, but is there some goal you have in mind or somewhere you want to go? You've talked about playing with Purdy with these, you know, amazing musicians, and, you know, maybe there's more musicians you want to play with, but, is, you know, do you have some personal goal for yourself, or right now are you just kind of not thinking about it, kind of riding the wave? Um, it's a great question. Um, I think when I, when I start to think about that question <laughs> is when I start to, uh, is, is when I can sort of veer into existential crisis. And, uh, and, and, but I, but I'm, I'm with you. I, I ask myself the same thing, you know. What's the, what's the goal? What's next? Where am I aiming? What, do I'm, what, am, what am I trying to achieve, you know? Like, uh, what's the end goal here, you know? And then I, but then I take a step back and take a breath and realize, like, there is no, there is no end goal. You know, it's like the, the you know, it's like a, like, Buddhist thing, like the path you know, is the way, the path is the goal or the whatever, like you, you, you're on it right now and that, and the goal is, and the goal is to just stay on it and uh, hopefully have all these things along the way that feel really gratifying and really amazing. And it's mostly in retrospect, you know, mostly like in the moment, I'm like super nervous and like uh, on some level of uncomfortable because I've put, hopefully, because I've pushed myself maybe outside my comfort zone, you know, or I'm playing with musicians who I feel like are like, Oh my, you know, like, what am I doing here? You know, like it's 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 that that's a feeling that I've that I've realized comes with comes with that path. But but looking back on it, on some of these experiences that I hopefully will continue to have, it's like, whoa, that was that was it. You know, like like when I think about like, well, what's the goal? What am I aiming for? It's like, oh, that was that was it. You know, and hopefully that'll be it again. You know, yeah. um, so uh, yeah, just personally, I think I just want to keep. I want to like stay present uh, and enjoy those moments, which I, I now realizing happen all, all the time, you know. Um, yeah, keeping on playing with great musicians is really inspiring to me, playing great music, playing on great records, um, and, uh, and just being like open musically, you know. Um, I think that's, that, that's the goal, if, there, if I can, if, I, if there is one, you know. That's nice. I'm glad you asked that. I, I think sometimes of uh, that Donny Hathaway had had the uh, response to that when he named that one song with the great Willie Weeks bass solo, "Everything Is Everything." Mm -hmm. You know. Amen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think so. And that ba and yeah, maybe that bass solo is kind of everything too. <laughs> that 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 once we I haven't realized mentioned like Donny Hathaway live. Yeah. Was that one of the ones? One of the records that well you were steered towards. Yeah, or? Donny Hathaway live uh, was partially recorded at the Troubadour in L.A. And when I got to, that's another cool thing as part of playing with cool musicians is, is playing cool, led you know venues that really you feel like oh my god I'm standing standing in the footsteps hallowed ground you know I remember playing the the Troubadour with Joey last year and thinking like wow this is potentially where I'm sitting is potentially where Willie Weeks played that bass solo. <laughs> you know, it was either there or the bitter end, where, like, it was half and half. The other half of the record, yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, no, that's somehow true, isn't it? Everything is everything. Yeah. Great question. Uh, is there another one? Hi. Um, <laughs> okay, two things. One, you're on my phone case, and I think you're wearing the same shirt right now that you are on my phone case. I hope so, yes. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, also... He has an endorsement. Yeah, that. that's right. Sure. Yep. Um, <laughs> and then secondly, uh, I'm a guitarist. I was just wondering, like, you've played with some awesome guitarists. What it is that you, like, look for in a guitarist, I, I guess, like, ish? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, when, I, when I play with, uh, like, I've realized how different guitarists, like, just h how broad the spectrum of the types of guitarists there are out in the world like maybe it has to do with that instruments um like the legacy of that instrument and how and how how far the boundaries have been pushed since like the invention of the electric guitar you know and how many different directions you can go with it and what one guitarist does really well is not what another guitarist does really well like there's the like david t walker like s s style of playing that i think he like invented or 
steered one chan one you know sort of stream of the guitarist like river down but then there's like the like the prince thing that Corey I is sort of on and then there's like i don't know where theo f lands really because he's like such a multi-instrumentalist and maybe maybe w what he really does is like serving the music um which he kind of does on every instrument um but when it comes to playing with guitarists like it's a lot of the same thing i think i look for in in any other uh, instrumentalist is is uh, like sensitivity and time, like we talked about, um, and uh, supporting. You know, playing playing supportively, uh, and uh, and locking and locking in. Um, I'm trying to think of like specifically. There's there's really nothing I look for because what I really love about guitarists is is the breadth of uh, voices that that like on that instrument, like it's just amazing to me, like when you hear one guitarist, you know, if you hear SRV or Hendrix or, you know, Prince or John Mayer or something, like they all sound like themselves and no one really sounds like, I mean, maybe Mayer kind of, maybe his thing is sounding like other, maybe he, because he's such a scholar of it, and I love Mayer, but he's such a scholar, he can be like, or I could do like a BB thing, you know, or, or like, or I could do like a this thing, you know, he's really great at that. But a lot of guitarists, I feel like it's just like, wow, it's like, it's like hearing a, a singer, it's like hearing Aretha Franklin or something, it's like, well, you just sound like Aretha Franklin, you just sound like you. So, yeah, I guess if I were really going to boil it down, I'd say like, people who, who have a, who speak through it, have a, have a unique voice on it, sort of. I don't know. That's that, like really unspecific, but that's that's uh, yeah. That's fantastic. Great question. And Joe, that uh, you were referring to that earlier about honing your artistry, but not necessarily from those early lessons that you had from your teachers. The teacher saying, "Joe, I want you to become Verdine White forever." Right. No, you you took an inspiration, and it's kind of stored on your hard drive, yeah, so to speak. Yeah, you find your you find your own voice through learning learning what other voices sound like and how and where they're coming from and then you check out maybe the influences that they were checking out you know which that's where Jamerson comes co comes into things for me is because I didn't actually realize that the, the, the people I was looking up to were looking up to Jamerson you know, I, I mean I didn't hear flea and think like oh he's doing a Jamerson thing you know mm. like I also didn't know yeah. who Jamerson was until <laughs> flea hipped me to him you know so like checking out other people who have a voice and then checking out who they were checking out you know and yeah. even checking and and even non bassists, you know, I think I do really look to, you know, guitarists, so, so solo phrase, you know, phrasing or saxophone or like I said, Stevie Wonder's like, le you know, playing like you know, I think uh, you can find a uh, inspiration for how to speak on an instrument, even through uh, many other instruments, you know. Yeah, you know, we we um, we had James Jamerson Jr pass through when he was playing with the uh, that band that toured around the Standing in the Shadows of Motown mm -hmm. band after yeah. Bob Babbitt passed away James Jr. came by and uh, Steve Bailey he had something going on that day he said do you mind hanging out with James Jr. and and maybe like filming just what you talk about I'm like no I don't mind at all <laughs> and I got to hang out with him and, and we're playing a little bit and I went to the show the previous night and and I said, man, James, you sound so much like your father. And he said, I hope so. I mean, I listen to him a lot. Yeah. I grew up with him. How crazy! Is that? <laughs> but he was amazing, James Jr. Yeah. He had a thing going on. He had physically he had something going on with his spine. He he couldn't stand up that straight. But then they come out on stage, and the music wow. straightened them out. Yeah. Music is yeah. is the Powerful panacea of yeah. life you know it's true that's amazing yeah. to hear yeah because i i've seen other like sons uh you know like like sp offspring of musicians who maybe didn't even learn it from directly like with uh felix pastorius yes or um i recently saw uh pino paladino's son play rocco paladino you know um and i s when i hear that voice coming through and it's not always that they actually learned it from their parents but like 
it almost makes you feel like there's something in there, like genetically, you know, which is really amazing. And yeah, with Jamerson, I mean, there's some of, there's some of that I think in the just gene pool of bass players because we're all, because it's like such an important part of the vocabulary of it, you know. Yeah, it's got to be. And his playing is just ubiquitous. I mean, yeah. you go to the market to get a yeah a soda or something, yeah. and there's James playing on those I little speakers. He's just greatest. everywhere. I yeah. know. Yeah, um, truly. Well. In in closing, Joe, I, I just want to say that um, you're such an inspiration to to all of us. What you do, and, and I speak for everybody to, to thank you for that. And 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 the, the other thing is that you're you're turning young people on to this instrument, um, to how to play it, to how to feel good playing it, and and th that's you're playing a huge role in 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 the. Uh, in the progression and the evolution of, of this thing called bass. Thanks, Danny. That yeah. it really means a lot to me. It means a lot to be here with you guys, and uh, it's been such a warm welcome. Um, yeah, th well, thank you so course, much. It really I mean, means a lot to me. On, on behalf of, you know, Steve Bailey and uh, the chair and Sandro Scotia, the assistant chair, and just uh, right on down from the top, I've, I've seen so many people this week, Joe Dart's coming in. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, he's really psyched. Ah, so great to hear. Because everybody Thanks, really man. thinks highly of you and what you're doing, um, don't you? <laughs> and, and, um, Thank you, guys. <laughs> Appreciate it. Yeah. So, and we, and uh, uh, we want you to uh, keep making more music and staying healthy. And, and thank you for sharing um, your life with us and, and coming up from New York. And, uh, and bring Wolfpack here soon. It's a promise. It's a promise. Yeah. Thank you, guys. All right, Joe. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Have a wonderful evening. Joe, this rig is cooking, huh? <laughs> it doesn't disappoint. Perfect, man. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. The light, that's why we cool. had the shade.